In this short tutorial, we are going to look at a part of the Creative Toolkit that a lot of 3D modelers overlook, and that's displaying your hardware to its full potential. It's not always clear or fully controllable how your asset will be displayed in a game. That depends on a lot of different factors, and many of those can change on a diverse project with lots of chefs stirring the pot. However, you do have control of how you display your assets on your portfolio. And you want to do your hard work justice, not just for potential employers, but for yourself. It's nice to be able to see your hard work in its full glory. But this is one area that I see students or new artists neglect, and it doesn't have to be complicated. It used to be that we had to learn how to light and render with complicated software, but now we have really great tools like Marmoset Toolbag that more closely mimic what your asset will look like in Engine. So in this video, I will go over how to quickly and simply set up your asset from Substance Painter into Marmoset and add some simple lights that take best advantage of the unique details of your asset. Now, this is for Marmoset 3, but I will be making one for 4, though it's the same, just some of the tools may be in different locations. If you like this video or find it helpful, please press like to help push this video out of the murky depths of YouTube. For more on this topic, or if you would like a full tutorial on an asset like this, let me know in the comments. So in this section, we're going to be looking at how to render your freshly textured asset in Marmoset. Now, we've set this up as a UE4 scene, so I would definitely encourage you to export them ready to go into UE4 for whenever you need them, or for Unity, if that may be the case. Uh, but for Marmoset, it's actually probably easier just to go up to the top and go to uh, Document Channels Normal plus No Alpha and export that into your folder. So what that will come out with is it will split every channel into its own layer. Uh, so it's really easy to plug into a uh, Marmoset when we get there. Now I've saved these out as 2K. You might even want to save them as 4K. These are going to be beauty renders. So we really want them to be as nice as possible. You can leave it as ping or you can change it to Targa if you wanted extra uh, quality. But I've always found for this stuff at least uh, ping to be okay. So we can export them out and bring them into an open up Marmoset. Now I've already done a texture pass on this previously, so I'm just gonna use them textures. So in Marmoset, what we wanna do is we wanna find our OBJ. So we want our oil can low, the same one as we use in Substance Painter, and we can just drop that into Marmoset. All right, so it's come in nice and neat, and we wanna create a new material. And the first thing we're gonna do is just set up the new material. So just like in Substance Painter, if we shift and right click, we can drag in the back to change the rotation of our HDRI map, our lighting map. So we're gonna get something nice like that. And then in our new material, we can start off with the roughness map. So we open up our textures that we've exported out. You can see here, I have quite a selection there, everything but uh, the emissive, because I didn't make an emissive for this particular one. We can grab our roughness and we want to place it into gloss. Okay, so we want to make sure this is loading in correctly, first of all. So we put that in gloss. If we just grab this material and drag it over here and put it on the layer stack top for the oil can, and minimize that, we can see our roughness has appeared on here. So once we've dropped our roughness map into there, we want to go ahead and invert that can check that over, make sure it looks okay. So it should be uh, more shiny on the metallic bits and anywhere that there isn't dust and stuff like that. So I can see I've got some paint strips there and that's less reflective than the rest. Uh, the next thing we can do is add our metallic to this. So we, we go down to re reflectivity and change it from specular to metalness. We can see that looks metal now and we can change, we can drop our metallic map into that slot there. Okay, so once that metallic map's uh, slotted in, we can go to little cog and we can turn off sRGB, click OK. And we wanna make sure sRGB is also turned off for the roughness map as well. And we don't need to invert that, we can leave that as is. So now we've got our, you can see the metal bits are shining through, the painted bits there, just how it should be. And the caps, which are plastic in my, uh, nice and muted. Uh, so the next thing we want to drop in is the normal map. So we open this, we get two normal maps, and you can see which one's the actually correct normal map. It's the DirectX one. It's got all the information on there. So you want to grab that and drop it into the surface here. And then at the moment, it's coming inverted uh, because we need to flip the Y channel. So 
now you can see our model has all the details and the metalness and roughness that it needs. Okay, now last but not least, we can drop our color on there. The reason I always use the color to last is because it's much easier to see the effects of the roughness, metallic, and normal map without the color on there. And you want to make sure these are set up correctly. So we grab our base color, we can just drop it onto the albedo section there. And we can see our base colors come in nicely. And that can be sRGB. It's the only one that should have sRGB ticked on. Now we also have a few other maps in here. So one of the other ones that we want to use is the occlusion. So we go down to occlusion and tick on the little arrow. We want to tick occlusion on. And in that first occlusion map box, we want to grab our AO and just drop that in there. And that'll just add a little bit of AO to the smaller details and make this pop a little bit. It's really worthwhile getting to grips with using Marmoset. It's such a simple program, but it really helps you render your models uh, nicely and quickly. Uh, and to, to get the most out of it doesn't take a lot at all. So you basically, you've got a ground plane that you want to put in. So we go over here, we can hit the ground plane and this will just capture some shadows. You don't always need this. Sometimes it can be a little bit more trouble than it's worth, but for a nice bit of AO underneath the oil can, it, I reckon it's, it's well worth it. Now, what I also like to do at this point is set up a new camera. So we just get in a position that I kind of like. So I'm going to go for something like this. I'm going to go to camera mode. I'm going to go to the layer stack here and I'm just going to click the camera button on the top. This will create a new camera. And then on that camera, I just want to set up the field of view. So I'm going to go here and I want to go set it to maybe 55 and then zoom in a little bit. So that'll just kind of give the lens a bit more of kind of a fisheye look to it. And then I want to lock this camera. So I'm just going to go to little lock there and lock that. That'll stop me moving this camera once I've got it in place. So I want to go back to my main camera now. So if I go up to camera one in the corner of the viewport here and select main camera, I can now scroll around that and I can see the other camera there as well. So I can come back to that camera anytime I want to check how, you know, how it's looking. Okay then, so first, the next thing we want to do is set up a little bit of lighting. So I'm going to go back to my main camera and I'm going to go and select sky. And then in sky, I'm going to click presets. And here we have a few different HDRI maps that we can go through. So I like to go through all of these and just find something that kind of is interesting from the get-go and then we can start doing some editing to that. So I'm just going to go through each one and hold shift and right mouse button and drag in the background just to move the lights around, see if I can find something that I'm happy with. So I'm just going to go for this portico image and click done. Now I'm going to change the mode from ambient sky to color because I just want a solid color in the background so that not to distract from the main asset. I'm going to go quite dark with this one. You can go light or dark, it's up to you. Sometimes I like to add a little bit of blue to it, but I'm just going to go for a gray. And then I'm going to increase the overall brightness of the scene just slightly. And then I'm going to rotate this until I get something that I like initially. Okay. Now, once I'm happy with this, I'm going to go back to my main camera so I can look around this model and we can add some lights to this scene now, or we can use the lights in the actual uh, skylight. So first of all, I'm going to show you how you add a light to this. Now I like to add a light by getting in the position I want the light to shine from and then uh, clicking new light to make one in that position. Now it's worthwhile having a look at a little bit of photography lighting. Normally you have a fill light, a key light and a rim light. So the fill light would give an overall uh, glow to this. So if I just change, turn off the sky so we can see how this works. I'm going to go high up to the top and I'm going to add a bit of a fill light, maybe coming down a little bit to the front, to one side. So I'm going to go up here and hit light. And this is our main fill light. So I need to increase the brightness. And then I don't want such hard shadows. So I'm going to increase the length and the width so that the source light is a lot more blurred, a bit like a diffuse box. And the distance is fine. I'm just going to change the spot angle up a bit as well to make that nice large light. Next one I want to do is add a key light. 
So I'm going to obtain the key light from this angle. It's a forward facing bright light and this will give most of the light on the front of this object. So again, get in a position, hit light and this key light again, I'm going to have quite big length to it. So as to avoid these harsh shadows in the background. And I'm going to change the spot angle to be quite large and I'm going to turn the distance up a little bit for more. And then I'm going to go back to my main camera with that key light selected and just change the brightness and see if I can get it somewhere that I like. Go back to my main camera and I'm just going to reposition this a little bit. Now positioning things in Marmoset isn't the easiest. It can be quite annoying. And the last thing I want to do is add a rim light to this as well. So again, go back to my main camera. The rim light is just to highlight some of them edges. So I'm going to go pretty much to the back of this and then I'm going to create another light and then go back to my main camera to see where the light's coming from. Okay, so I just want to move it around a little bit. And again, I'm going to increase the length and the width of this so that it covers a bigger area of this model. And I'm going to bring it in a little bit closer as well. So that's more effective. And I'm going to crease this spot angle as well so it doesn't create cast a shadow on that on that uh, shadow caster there. You can also change it to an omni light if you wanted. But I'm going to keep this as a spot for now. So I'm going to keep switching back and forth to the main camera and the the camera that I want to render from. And what we're doing here, we're just moving these lights. I'm just looking at the edges of things here and I'm just trying to find a good position for this that just highlights some of the roughness and some of the edges and some of those extra details that are otherwise lost in the fact that there's no lighting there to catch on them. And you don't need to just add one. You can add multiple of them as well if you think your scene requires that. So once you've got something you like, you can also change the colours of these as well. Sometimes it's nice to add uh, two different kinds of coloured fill light. Uh, you see a lot of people do this even on like YouTube videos and stuff like that, or photography. They add maybe like a blue light and an orange light. They contrast nice together and can create a bit of depth to the scene. Uh, for this, I don't really want too much because I don't want to hide the colours of the, uh, the actual can too much. So then we can also add in our skylight back in there. So we, we've got this pretty much lit how we want, but the skylight adds reflections to this. So it's not just a light, it actually adds more interest into the reflections that we get off the metal and, and the, the reflective paint. So if we turn that back on, turn the brightness down a little bit, you can see we've got some more interesting colors and shapes in there now. So the other way we can add in lights uh, is to, just reduce these back down. So I'm still going to use these, but they're going to be more of a of a fill light. So I'm just going to turn the brightness down on all of these, and I'm going to use the skylight more. So if we come back to our skylight, I'm going to turn the brightness up just a little bit, get this into a nice position again. And what I'm going to do is click on the image uh, to add extra lights to this this scene. So it'll take the pixel that you put over and it'll create a light from that position on this orb. So you can imagine this is in a sphere and it's, it's surrounding this item and it'll put a, a light shining from that position. So if we click here, you can see as I move this light around here, it'll take the color from the pixel and the position on that uh, HRI map and shine it against the uh, oil can. So it's an omni light basically. So what I'm doing is just going to find my first light here, which I want to just highlight nicely. And you can see underneath the skylight, we get a new light parented to that. We can see if we select that light, we get the gizmo up, which allows us to actually rotate this light around there. So you can't move it anywhere, but you can use the gizmo with the rotation to move it in the U and V of that texture map. 
So basically you want to use the red and the green one and just move side to side to reposition that light. And then we can change the brightness of that as well. So I'm going to, again, I'm going to go back to the skylight and I'm going to select another light. I'm just looking for a nice color. Okay, and once I've got that, I'm gonna reposition this on the map. And I'm gonna soften this one a little bit. And for this one, I'm going to turn off cast shadows because I don't like the shape that it's making there. Increase the brightness. And again, go back to my skylight and just do this until I've got all my highlights where I want them. Okay, and then you can even, once you're happy with that, you can mix the other lights back in, your actual physical lights. Especially if you want to add, say, some more fill to the overall image. So now we've got our lights roughly placed, we can increase the quality of the overall render. So to do that, we can go up to the render settings and there's a lot of things we want to tick on here. So we can, we can include local reflections. So if we turn that on, you can see that we will get bounce reflections from the, the various parts of this. And it's really up to you whether you want them on or off. Uh, we can include ambient occlusion. So if we tick that on, we can see we start to get some ambient occlusion on the base of this. And this is why I like this, uh, this ground plane in, the shadow catcher for the ambient occlusion. I just want to make that a little bit smaller in size and increase the strength. So the next thing we can do is come down to global illumination and enable, enable GI. And this will just uh, increase the quality of that lighting around certain areas. So we can see we get some deeper shadows underneath the strap there. And overall, it just makes it look a little bit, uh, uh, overall, it just gives it a little bit more depth. And we can increase the occlusion details up to 4K as well. Now, the last thing we want to take on is high res shadows. And I normally just keep this unticked until I'm going to actually take a screenshot because this increases the, uh, the, the strain on the system tenfold and it's really the only if you're finding that your scene is moving really sluggishly this is probably the only thing you need to untick it does make a massive difference so for now because it doesn't really make a much of a distance to the viewport only to the final render i'm just going to leave that unticked for now and i'm going to go to my camera that i've locked off camera one and i'm going to add a few settings to this as well now we've got a few different things here we've already changed the uh the field of view so we don't need to search anything like that but we can also set on focus so if you have multiple items in your scene you could turn on depth of field and then you can change the focus distance so we just move this so that the can is in focus and then once that is in focus we can uh, it scale the far blur down so this is good if you've got maybe a much larger object that needs a bit more depth or if you've got multiple objects in your render scene but for this because it's just one single asset i don't want to have any focus on it because it generally just decreases the overall uh, uh, detail in the scene, which is not what I want to do. I want to actually show this whole asset off as a portfolio piece. So I'm going to go back to my camera here and I'm just going to turn off depth of field. So we can also enable the safe frame as well. Now this is what I've got set in my image capture settings. So this is what will actually be captured in my image. And I want to go down and there's a few other little things I can do. We can add bloom to this 
uh, to kind of highlight some of them brighter spots there. But you want to be really, really cautious with this because it can overwhelm your scene very, very easily. So I'm just going to add the tiniest amount to the edges there. And if you're just doing the one screenshot, you can also add a vignette to this. This focuses in nicely on the item that you're doing. Now, as I'm doing a few of these, I don't want a vignette to this. I might add that in post in Photoshop. But maybe if you're doing a turntable or something like that, the vignette would be good to leave it on. You can also add some, uh, you can also sharpen this a little bit. Now, you don't want to go too much with a sharpen because uh, it's very noticeable. But it is good if you just add just a little tiny bit just to crispen up some of them edges. Now I like to actually do a sharpen in Photoshop when I when I edit these finally before putting them in my portfolio. But for this, I'm just gonna add just a tiny little bit. You've also got uh, settings here to affect the contrast and exposure and stuff like that. But with this kind of stuff, I find that unless you're doing a video, you might as well do this in, in post. Uh, maybe I'll just increase the contrast a tiny bit for this one and maybe increase the saturation a little bit. You really don't want to overdo these settings because it can start to look a bit silly. So once you've set all this up, you want to set your uh, capture folder. So if we go to edit and go to preferences, you see down at the bottom here, you have where you want to capture your images. Now I'm going to go to capture and I'm going to go to settings. In settings, I want to set the size, width and height of my image and the sampling. The sampling probably the most important part. So I want to change this to 100. So this is how many times it'll sample the light and you'll get a much smoother, nicer, high quality image. And you've also got the format as well. Ping is okay, but I find that there can be some errors with this, uh, some little artifacts that really show once you start editing in Photoshop. So for this, I'm actually going to save it out as a 16 bit PSD. I find this has quite a smooth and quality result. I'm going to click okay. And then I'm going to go to capture again and I'm just going to hit image. And it'll take a few seconds, but this will capture an image and put it in that folder, which you can then open up in Photoshop. So in Photoshop, if we go here, we can see that we have got this screenshot taken from uh, Marmoset. We open up that, you can see it's really nice quality, it looks nicer than it does in the viewport, nice and smooth, good render, the shadows nice and smooth, and so is the lights without any kind of grain or artifacting. And that's what you're looking for. If you do get something like that, or any jaggies in them shadows, you need to go and try and smooth out them lights a little bit. So what I like to do is just duplicate this image, Control J on that layer, and then I'm going to start adding some layer effects to this. And a good way of doing that is to either go to image and adjust Now you can go through the auto tones and stuff like that or you can go to image uh, sorry image adjustment and select from these or if you want to do it non-destructively we can go to the uh, layers here so we can go to levels for example put a levels on there and I'm just going to adjust the levels on this a little bit crisping up some of them highlights and shadows and then I'm going to go back down here and I'm going to also add a color balance. Now, I always like to do a little color balance on all my things. So start with the midtones. I'm just going to go through these and push the colors either warmer or colder. Go to the highlights. Now, I don't actually think this one needs much adjustment. It's already quite nice. But if there was a certain effect you were going for, this is the place to try and get that. So once you've edited your image to where you want it to be, uh, you can collapse this down. What I like to do is just add a little sharpen on top of everything. So what I'm going to do is just, I'm going to select all this and duplicate it all and then collapse it down. So I've still got this editability underneath if I want to go back a step. And then I'm going to du duplicate that layer. So I'm just going to give this a tiny little sharpen. So I'm going to go to filter, sharpen, sharpen. And then I'm going to change the opacity of that map that I've sharpened down. So I'm just going to go to zero and I'm going to bring it up until some of that extra detail just comes into more sharp relief. I really don't want to overdo this because it'll start looking way too gamey. So literally just a tiny little edit on there. And then once you're happy with uh, your asset, you can crop the image and add your name or your logo to it. And then that's uh, image one for your portfolio. Now you can also render out wireframes as well and you can do some nice editing with the wireframes. It's also a good idea to maybe show your maps, your color map and your normal map next to these with your UV layout. This stuff all adds to what the employer would want to see anyway. They want to say that you can do a very nice asset but that you can also do 
it technically correct as well. So nice UVs, nice texture maps and so on. So it's good to just display them and display them in a really nice pleasing manner. Uh, so to get wireframe on, if you go back to your Marmoset file, you can go to the render and just tick on wireframe and then you've got you can set the color of the wireframe and the thickness of the wireframe and also the opacity of it as well so you want to do something not too garish but if you did something like this what you could do is take two shots of this one with wireframe one without you could even do like a a semi uh, fade between the wireframe one and the unwireframed one and that is pretty much all there is to doing uh, lighting in Marmoset. There's lots of other different little things you can mess with. You can do a turntable and animations. You can also add some atmospheric fog in there as well. Uh, but generally to get a nice shot, you want to just concentrate on your lighting, the colors of your lights and the position of them and try and highlight some of them details that you spent so long working on either in ZBrush or in Substance Painter. So again, if you like this video, please consider subscribing and hitting the like button. And also, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. See you in the next video.